So it's my pleasure now to give an introduction to our speaker tonight, Alan Wells, who presenting Long-Legged Waiting Birds of Southern New York. So Alan Wells has lived in Rockland County for over 35 years, and he's known as a regional birding leader, been involved with Rockland Audubon, Audubon Council in New York, Ed, uh, Edgar Mearns Bird Club, and the interesting group some of you may not know about, the Palisades Interstate Park Commission League of Naturalists, a group of folks that do a lot of work in Harriman and elsewhere, uh, different studies for natural history. Alan has a PhD in zoology from University of Alberta, Edmonton, with a subsequent career in environmental engineering. He's retired now, but you wouldn't know it. He's quite busy. He and Della uh, go out birding every day, I think. And Alan teaches online courses in odonates, that's dragonflies, damselflies, and pollinator ecology for the New York Botanical Garden. So large wading birds have really been sort of a passion of mine for quite some time, and I just love photographing them. Uh, they're relatively easy to find. They're beautiful, they're graceful, and they have a whole lot of interesting behaviors and keep you occupied for quite a while. Uh, there's no formal definition of what constitutes the large wading birds, um, but the group is frequently thought to include the uh, family Aridae. Um, and those are the herons, the egrets, night herons, and bitterns. Now, some people also include the ibises, storks, spoonbills, and flamingos. But for tonight's presentation, it's going to be time pressed as it is. So I'm going to limit it just to, to the, the heron family, the heredates. So just what makes a heron? Uh, first of all, they have this, this long S-shaped neck, and they have a, an interesting anatomical adaptation. The sixth and seventh cervical vertebrae are, are modified. The sixth is elongated, the seventh is shortened, and this, um, with the muscle attachments, it gives them extra power in um, you know, reaching out with the, their um, build jabs. Uh, they also have a pectinate or a comb-like inner edge to the middle claw. Uh, they use that for removing fish oil and other debris from their feathers. And they also have three, except in the bitterns, which have two um, pairs of powdered down feathers. Um, now, these are specialized downy feathers that disintegrate very quickly into a very fine powdery material. You can almost think of it as a heron talcum powder. So they, they have those three main characteristics in common. So let's start off with our most familiar species, the uh, great blue heron. And I'm going to spend a bit more time on this one because it's a good archetype for the rest of the group. Um, great blue heron, um, this is a very large bird. It measures about four and a half feet in length. Uh, it has a six foot wingspan, but yet it only weighs a little more than six pounds. And as I said, it's our largest, largest wading bird. There are three races of great blues in North America. All three are very similar in appearance. Uh, the nominate form, Herodias, uh, is widespread throughout the Northeast. Uh, reaches into central the U.S. and Canada. Uh, the uh, Ward's heron, Herodia, Herodias wardi, um, is found across southern U.S., um, you know, Florida, Texas, Gulf, Texas, um, and the West Coast. And then there's a Pacific form that's uh, found only in the Washington State, British Columbia, uh, Southeast Alaska area. And throughout much of the lower U.S., the species is a year-round resident. You can see that purple area on the map. They, they do migrate northward somewhat in the breeding season. Uh, great blue heron can be found uh, in freshwater lakes, streams, wetlands, estuaries, marine waters, and pretty much anywhere there's water, and even in some places where there's very little to no water. In the lower Hudson Valley, great blues can be found throughout the year. During the winter months, January through March, they occur in very low numbers. Um, 
you know, when you do find them, they're generally in small groups. Uh, th this particular group was uh, about 20 birds. You can't see all of them, but it's about 20. This is in a kind of a sheltered cove area or shoreline area of uh, Rockland uh, Lake. To keep warm during the winter, uh, great blues will often kind of face into the sun. Uh, they'll droop their wings and spread them. Uh, it, you know, this exposes their undersides uh, to the sun and uh, helps them maximize the solar radiation. Numbers of great um, numbers of great blues in the Lower Hudson Valley begin building around mid March um, into April uh, as the migrants begin to arrive. Numbers peak in early August. Uh, this is when the locally produced juvenile birds begin venturing out to forage on their own. And then the numbers decline again through the rest of the, the season. Uh, it's a pretty easy bird to find, uh, to see, uh, relatively abundant. Uh, you can see on this chart, this is data from um, eBird. And at the peak of their seasonal occurrence, they're reported on about 30% of the uh, checklists that are submitted. And you'll see, compared to some of the others we'll look at, yeah, that's a pretty high number. Hey, in the spring, males are the first of the migrants to arrive and they immediately begin working on um, building a nest. They'll usually select an area that was previously used try not to build one from scratch. And the nests are usually nothing more than just a, a loose collection of sticks. Like most of the uh, herons, they're communal nesters. Um, they'll frequently nest um, with just other great blue herons, but not always. They'll occasionally um, nest with other herons, and egrets, and or in this area, especially with cormorants. Nests are typically located in very tall trees, um, surrounded by f thick vegetation and usually on or near water. And they especially like nesting on islands. Uh, this particular photo was taken at the uh, Ramapo River Access Rookery in Harriman State Park. And there's about you know, a little over a dozen nests in these couple trees. Now, one of the first displays that you'll see in the early spring consists of two birds uh, just standing or walking slowly side by side with their necks outstretched and their wings outstretched. And this was something that was originally known as a gathering ground dance. And it was thought to be associated with uh, courtship. Um, the problem with that is you don't know the sexes of these. That um, There's virtually nothing to distinguish males from females in most of the herons, but in great blues, the females are about 5% smaller, but that's not enough that you can really definitively say that this is a female and that this is a male. So the exact nature of this relationship wasn't really known uh, until fairly recently. Um, and further research has demonstrated that these displays continue well beyond the nesting season. So uh, displays occur only in foraging areas, so always away from the nest site. So along their foraging areas and also right at the boundaries of the foraging areas. So it's um, prob pretty conclusive that these are, are now um, uh, territorial defense, defending um, probably males defending their their uh, their feeding areas. And just to give you an idea of what this display really looks like and why you might actually consider the or confuse this with a, a, a courtship dance. Um, you can see the two two birds slowly approaching one another. They've got one or two wings kind of outstretched at the moment, no slight amount. And then they'll line up 
pretty much side by side. Actually, this one is actually um, driving the, the uh, second bird off right here, but things aren't giving up at this point yet. So again, they're, they're still kind of squaring off. And for some reason, a, a third bird tries to join in. I'm not quite sure what that's about unless they're infringing on the second bird's territory. Um, uh, how do you tell a, a breeding bird, a bird that's ready for breeding? Um, one of the first outward signs are that um, the bill actually turns uh, bright yellow. It's usually kind of a yellow, dull yellowish, even some black on it. Um, and the lores will go from kind of a dull grayish to a more uh, or brighter blue gray. And they'll develop these long plumes, especially on the, the, the neck, the back, and the breast. It takes about three years for a, a great blue heron to reach sexual maturity. Okay. Pairing and reproduction in great blues, as in the other aridids, um, can be thought of in five separate stages. And the first is the solo stage. This is where an unpaired male chooses and defends a nest site. And initially, a male will move in, he'll set up the nest, and it'll defend a large area around that nest. But as the season progresses, that, that area becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until it's reduced down to the nest proper. And at that stage, even females that come in um, they, they will be initially rebuffed by the males. They'll be treated as any other intruder and be driven off. The bachelor stage, second stage, um, this is once the male has attracted one or more of the satellite females to his vicinity. And the females will come into the nest and they'll often come in with a, a wing flap and uh, it's called a, a squawking kind of landing call. And again, she'll be greeted in return with a, really a, an agonistic um, display, a threat display. Um, here you can see it's called a, a stretch and a, a fluffed neck. As I said, these are basically threats. Um, over time, this sort of threat um, will be threatening behavior will become less intense and the female will gradually be accepted onto the nest. Um, I should point out that the females don't return to the previous year's nests, even though males might, but um, the females don't and they will select a new mate each year, um, but they'll, they'll be monogamous throughout the, that particular breeding season. Okay, the third stage is a paired stage, and this begins once the male allows the female into the nest. And again, it starts off rather hostile. Um, the pair bonding begins with what they call bill duels. This is kind of a, a ritualized um, attack where the male stabs at the female. And this will go on for a couple hours until things kind of de-intensify. And this will give way to a, a mutual bill clappering, which both males kind of, uh, or both birds trade bill slaps. And mating can take place any, any time along this timeline, but you know, usually after they've calmed down a bit. Um, and during the, this, this particular time period, the female will spend most of the day away from the nest. Now she's off feeding, probably building up energy stores for the long time she's going to be on the nest. So it's mainly lone males that you'll see on the nest. Um, they'll interact with the female when she comes in, but she'll go back out again. Okay, the fourth stage is the incubation phase. And here, um, typically, the uh, female lay three to five pale blue eggs um, and they're 
they produce uh, individual eggs and they're laid at two, maybe sometimes three day intervals. And she'll start incubating these eggs immediately. So what this is gonna do is lead to um, asynchronous hatching and ultimately chicks of different sizes. And in nutrient poor years, uh, the larger tick chicks may end up actually pushing the smaller chicks out of the nest. Um, the total incubation period runs around 25 to 29 days. So that's a basically a month. And throughout this period, the males will bring in uh, sticks back to the nest and hands them to the female, but the female in turn uh, fits each stick into the nest. So she's building while she's incubating as well. And finally, the parental stage, this is from hatching until independence of the young. And in great blue herons, this can last up to three months. For the first three to four weeks, at least one parent's um, constantly on the nest. Uh, males will usually take the daytime shift. The females usually take the nighttime. But after that three or four week period, then the young will be left, can be left alone for quite some time. The young can fly at about 60 days, but will usually remain in the area or on the nest up to another 30 days after they're capable of leaving, but they'll stick around, I guess, for the free meal. Um, so when you think about it, the, the young great blue herons aren't really fully independent till probably as long as 90 days or almost three months. Hey, distinguishing the juveniles from the adults was really pretty easy. Uh, the adults have this white crown, uh, the long plumes. Uh, they have this black shoulder patch. Um, they have black on the flanks and uh, on the primary feathers. Whereas the, the juveniles have a, a solid dark grayish crown, you know, virtually no plumes, no shoulder patch, and they lack the, the black on the belly and wings. The great blue herons are ravenous predators and will consume almost anything they catch. Um, some of the sizes of things they swallow is absolutely astounding. Um, they eat anything from invertebrates, reptiles, amphibians, uh, birds, They'll even eat mammals such as voles and ground squirrels. And this, this lower photograph, this was a picture taken out in California. This one was hunting um, California ground squirrels, which is a good size, about the size of our gray squirrels. But by far the bulk of their diets fish, such as uh, this bluegill, and the, these food items are always swallowed whole and head first. Okay. Um, I was a little dishonest right at the first when I said um, that there were three forms of great blue herons. Um, if you look at current literature, you'll actually see a fourth. And this is the great white heron, or Ardea herodius occidentalis. And originally, this was described as a full species, um, but as really without much evidence, it's been uh, relegated to a subspecies. And there's qu currently quite a bit of controversy over whether it should remain a subspecies or be elevated to a full species. We could probably spend a whole evening on this and maybe talk about that some other time, but um, it's a very interesting bird. The um, great white heron is found in Southern Florida and the Caribbean and really doesn't wander very far. Well, actually, no, excuse me, it does. It, it can wander uh, occasionally. Uh, pretty long distances. And there's been at least one record from Long Island. Uh, there's been uh, uh, sightings in other parts of New England and Northeast. Um, sometimes when you hear of these far-flung reports, you've got to be little, take it with a little grain of salt uh, in that you can also confuse 
either a leucistic or even an albino great blue heron with a great heron, or you may confuse it with uh, species coming up the, the great egret. Um, in the field guides, you may see another rather uncommon form of great blue heron, and this is Werdemann's heron. Uh, this form is a result of the hibernation, hybridization between the great white heron and wards, or that southern subspecies of great blue heron. And it's distinguished from the great blue by having varying degrees of white on the head and neck. I mean, this one was photographed in Cuba. It's just white on the, the head, but I've seen others that the, the whole neck may be white. Um, this one's rarely found outside of Florida, Southern Florida and Caribbean. I don't know of any records from around here, but something to always watch for. Okay, not to be confused with the great White heron is the great egret, which now is not actually an egret, but a true heron. So this gets a little confusing here. Um, it's actually smaller than the great blue heron and sometimes called a white heron or erroneous, erroneously a great white heron. Um, the uh, two species are really fairly easy to tell apart. You know, both have yellow bills, but the great egret ha has black legs, whereas the uh, great white heron has yellow legs. Great egrets found worldwide in North America. It's a year-round resident uh, in the southern U.S. and coastal areas of the Atlantic and Pacific. Um, and they tend to be a bit more migratory than the great blues. Um, great egrets are typically seen in our area from early April through late November. Uh, they're less likely to be found during the winter months, but they do occasionally show up. This is the second most uh, reported heron species in our area. And an eBird, they peak out at about, you know, showing up on about 12 to 15% of the eBird checklist. So probably roughly half the, the sightings of um, great blues. Um, great egrets do breed in the lower Hudson Valley region. Uh, spotting a breeding bird is relatively easy. Uh, the bill changes from yellow to orange. Uh, the lures change from yellow to green. And the eye changes, the iris of the eye changes from yellow to, to bright red when they're at peak breeding. And most conspicuously, they develop these long, wispy, wispy what they're called egret plumes. And in our area, there are several breeding locations in Westchester and Long Island and in you know, Rockland Lake. There's a, a number of them breeding in Lake DeForest. So they're around. Like other herons, great egrets build large stick nests. Um, usually in large multiple species um, communal rookeries, great regrets share most of the same nesting behaviors as uh, great blues, but great blues are, are, have what's called a, a reactive behavior pattern. They react to a signal or action that's been given to them. They'll respond with uh, another action. Whereas great egrets, on the other hand, are less reactive and they tend to be more sequenced and stereotyped and you can see this in this, this video clip here, that um, you know, the, the, the males are, well, they're repeating the same, this one's doing a preen, and then what's called a bow, and it's just repeating that over and over, but it's not actually seemingly directed towards the female here. Um, it's just whoever's watching, you know, I'll keep doing it and maybe somebody will notice. And she she takes off here in a second or two. There she goes and hops over to the next branch where here's a male doing a, a twig shake, shake coupled with a bow. 
And then this, the male over here is doing another preen and bow sequence. Okay. All right. Um, early stages of parenthood in great egrets is pretty similar to great blues. Uh, three to five nests, eggs per nest, um, laid a little sooner interval, one to two days. Again, asynchronous hatching. Um, their incubation period, 25 to 28 days, a little bit shorter than a great blue. Where they differ, however, is when the young fly, uh, 35 to 42 days, that's two to four weeks sooner than great blue. And then they leave the nest by about 42 days. Um, whereas remember, you know, that um, great blues will stay up to 90 days. So uh, the great egrets are um, sooner away from the nest. Distinguishing young great egrets is a bit more difficult. They're all both young and adults are white um, with yellow bill, black legs. Um, during breeding season, it's not too difficult because uh, the uh, adults have the long breeding plumes. Um, but non-breeding season, they'll lose those and they'll look very similar to the, uh, the young. This one happens to be in breeding season. So... It's probably young, and you can also see what's probably the remnants of some downy feathers on the neck. So it's pretty sure that this one's a young bird. Snowy egrets can look a lot like miniature versions of a great egret. Um, when they're standing side by side, the difference is pretty obvious, the size is tremendous, but um, when an individual is alone and especially tucked, it can sometimes be difficult to tell them apart. Um, you can look for uh, the yellow, yellow versus black bill and the bicolored legs versus black legs. There are two recognized subspecies in North America, the Eastern Thula and Western Brewster Eye. And again, they show up about the same time period as um, the, the great egret, April through October. And this is our fourth most um, you know, frequent sighting, but only two to 3% of the eBird checklist. So very unusual. Um, breeding birds can be told apart by the bright red lures. Um, and their plumes tend to be a little longer and fluffier. Close relative of the snowy is the uh, little blue heron. Uh, little blues are generally pretty well restricted to coastern, coastal southern areas. Uh, you rarely find them above, say, mid-New Jersey and northward. Um, the little blues are, are sort of darkish, bluish gray, pretty much all over. But as you approach breeding season, they get more of a maroon color on the neck. And they have this bicolored bill, um, light bluish gray at the base, black at the tip. Uh, when they're in full breeding mode, they get pretty spectacular. The, the plumes elongate and they get an intense blue around the base of the bill and the lores. And again, the eye color goes from yellow to red. Most of the little blues that we see in our area, not always, but most of the time are juvenile birds. And these are born white. They remain white through their first spring after hatching. Um, during that period, they may look very much like a snowy egret, uh, especially a juvenile snowy egret, because the juvenile snowies have the yellowish, greenish legs, and they also have a bicolored bill. Um, 
So the only way to tell them apart really is to check the lures. The, the snowies still have bright yellow lures. Um, after the, that first spring, blue feathers begin molting in and you can get some pretty odd looking patterns. Uh, this is a, uh, what's sometimes called a calico or pied heron. And this is a, a rather odd strategy to, to maintain that juvenile uh, plumage for an extra season, essentially. And one of the explanations has been that it's a, a form of mimicry, that it allows the, the young little blues to, to integrate in with the, the snowy egret feeding aggregations. And the studies have shown that the, these feeding groups um, may help to increase the food intake and growth of the individual. So it may be to their advantage to feed with the, the snowies. Tricolored heron, which is very rare here, um, looks like a, a half-sized um, great blue heron. And again, another coastal uh, southern species, but they, they tend to wander a fair bit. Um, yeah, I've even seen them up in Ohio and California and New Jersey. So they, they get around. And just recently there were reports of them uh, in New York. Um, Dune Road, I think, had one. Gilgo Beach had one. Um, Milford, Connecticut had another one. Um, but... Um, and, uh, don't know of any nesting in the lower Hudson Valley. And telling the juveniles apart, it's quite easy. Um, the, the juveniles are kind of a dull gray. They, they still have the white belly and neck, but yeah. And can the, the breeding birds go from yellow lures? And bill to bright blue and you know the eye looks red at that point as well and the plumes elongate then the rarest um, and most to me the most fascinating uh, the egrets to watch is the reddish egret and this one's very rare in our area as a in fact I only know of one record that was from Jamaica Bay in, uh, 1991 and this is a uh, again a southern coastal species but this one's much more tied to marine and saltwater environments than uh, the other egret um, mature reddish egrets have, they have this wild mane look you know, like lion's mane uh, which sloshes around in the breeze when they're uh, we're chasing prey and the young are, are just kind of this um, reddish sandstone color yeah to, to unfortunately to further complicated complicate things the um, Atlantic and Gulf population has two distinct color morphs you saw the the dark reddish morph they also have a white morph and uh, occurs in about two to 7% of the population. Uh, they're born white and they stay white through their entire lives. Um, and these birds can be very similar looking to a snowy egret or a young little blue. Um, they usually maintain the, the reddish base of the bill. You could tell them apart that way, but the other way that tell them apart is just watch their behavior. You know, if you see a bird running around like a chicken with its head cut off, chasing prey, then it's probably a reddish egret. Little green herons, our second smallest heron. It prefers uh, densely, densely vegetated regions with slow moving fresh water. However, occasionally you'll see it in, in marine environments. It's widespread throughout North America, the uh, Eastern fluorescence form. Shows up in April through mid-October, and this is our third most frequently reported heron. Occurs in about 10 to 12% of the eBird checklists. Um, it's 
while it's relatively common in our area, uh, it can be pretty secretive and sometimes difficult to see, but it, it is a common and widespread breeder in our area. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, Uh, yeah, and this, <laughs> um, green herons are, are usually solitary nesters, um, sometimes in loose aggregations, but um, usually by themselves. And this is a, a nest that, um, you know, Carol Weiss found at Rockland Lake. Uh, this is generally you know, typical of, of green heron nest, you know, just inches above the the, the water uh, and by itself. Yeah. You know, three to five eggs per nest is common. Incubation period is very short. This is only 17 to 21 days. And they leave the nest after about seven days. So rather than a month or two, you know, it's about a week. They're out climbing around by 14 days uh, branching and um, being fed away from the nests. And their first flight usually occurs around three weeks. So total independence is about a month versus remember three months for a great blue heron. So much faster. Um, the, the, this photo is kind of interesting. These two are being fed away from the nest and notice that how they grasp the, the bill of the adult. This is the adult here. Um, that they'll grasp the bill sideways and they'll pull the adult's head down towards the ground and that triggers the, the regurgitation reflex. Um, and that they'll throw up a, a fish or whatever food item. And that, that seems to be a common thing among a lot of the, the herons. The juvenile green herons are, uh, lack the, the, uh, the green, malachite green on the back and they're more striped. And most herons, if not nearly all, uh, have crests, although it's a lot, often barely noticeable in number of the adults. But um, in little greens, they, they seem to take full advantage of it. And you frequently see them with the crest raised whenever they're, they're agitated. Cattle egret is the only established non-native uh, egret in North America. And it's uh, easily recognized by its peculiar strutting and head bobbing motion when it walks. It's all our, our only non-aquatic heron. It's occasionally you'll see them in water, but rarely. It's a native to Africa and Europe and parts of Asia. Um, they dispersed from Africa to South America in the late 1800s. Um, dispersal was probably natural, um, maybe assisted by uh, easterly trade winds, but um, uh, by the 1950s, they were dispersing northward into Central America and Mexico and into the southern U.S. And by the 1970s, they were well established throughout much of the southern. Um, they went a, a huge population surge for a while and then seemed to have died back, but making a bit of a resurgence, it seems. Uh, during pre Peak breeding season, they develop these ornamental orangish brown feathers. Um, lores become pink. The, the, the bill gets a spectrum of, of red to yellow. And like the other herons, these are communal nesters. Uh, they'll nest with other species of herons. And the typical heron type nest is a shallow bowl. Um, there are some breeding sites on on, uh, on Long Island, but not in uh, Hudson Valley. And the next two are um, the night herons, the black crowned and yellow crowned, and these are far more nocturnal herons than the, the previous ones. That's not to say you can't see them during the day, but um, and 
particularly the the yellow crown, they seem to be a bit more uh, diurnal than the, the black crowned. The black crowns a nearly cosmopolitan species. Um, you can find them in fresh and marine environments. And neither here and you will usually see standing in water to fish. They usually just back up into the trees and vegetation. The yellow crown's a, a far more restrictive to uh, coastal environments than the black crown. Um, it's almost, uh, you will find it in uh, some freshwater areas, but uh, seems to prefer the marine environment. In our area, um, again, April through October, and in proportion, proportionally very few uh, yellow crowns. Uh, almost all of our sightings are black crowns, and even together peak out of about 3% of the eBird sightings. Telling the adults apart is fairly easy. Uh, the black crown herons have the name suggests a black crown, a black back, um, short legs, uh, white cheek, and a red eye. The yellow crown, obviously a yellow crown, gray back, long legs, white cheek, and a yellow eye. And notice, yeah, here you can use the eye color to tell the species apart, but that does not work for the juveniles. They're, they're red in both the yellow crown and the black crown. And pay particular attention to the, the uh, length of the legs. Uh, a lot of times you'll see herons flying overhead at dusk. And it's hard to tell what they are, but look at the feet. If the feet are projecting out just beyond the, uh, the tail, it's a, a black crown, whereas the yellow crown, they project well beyond the tail. Telling the juveniles apart, however, is a much more challenging undertaking. And black crowned has uh, coarser streaking on the breast, uh, larger teardrop uh, spots on the, the wings, whereas the and the short legs again. The yellow crown has fine streaking, fine dots, uh, longer legs. But what I found find most useful is to look at the bill. The, the bill color in the black crown is usually bicolor, not always. It can be all black sometimes, but uh, usually bicolor. And the, the bill is much more pointed, more almost not quite all shape, but um, a thinner bill. Whereas the um, yellow crowned bill is all black and kind of flattened, broader, you know, almost dagger like. Black crown night herons are heavily into feeding on fish. This one was tackling an armored catfish. I don't think he ever was able to get down. Uh, yellow crowns are primarily feed on crabs and crayfish. Uh, black crowns are a common breeder in the near shore regions of Long Island and the uncommon breeder in the um, lower Hudson. Uh, primarily in Westchester and Rockland counties. Well, they used to breed around the Piermont Pier area, but um, they don't seem to anymore. Yellow crown is much less common. It's a, on a Long Island and a rare breeder in Westchester and Rockland. And then the last four, four years, there's been a pair attempting to, to uh, nest in Orange County, but to date, they don't seem to have been successful. Okay. Most of our herons and egrets are rather conspicuous, but the last two are um, cryptically patterned and really highly secretive. Uh, this is the American bittern, um, which inhabits marshes and coarse vegetation along the edges of lakes and ponds. And the least bittern, which is our smallest heron, it averages 13 inches in length and less than three ounces. Um, it's a bird of densely vegetated marshes, particularly cattails and common reeds. Uh, during the winter, American bittern frequents coastal and freshwater wetlands and 
U.S. and into Mexico. Uh, during spring, they'll migrate northward. In the U.S., only there's only a single subspecies of least bittern. And American bittern seems to show up first in our area around the first part of April. Um, the least bittern in the yellow color comes in later, seems to leave sooner. And with the, the um, American bittern, you notice this sharp peak and then they, they kind of taper off and last actually almost into end of December. And I think that may have more to do with the detectability um, that when they come in in the spring, they're advertising um, and, and quite vocal. And so they're probably more easily detected. Uh, I'm not sure that they, they are actually in any less or more numbers. Um, Okay, both species, as I said, are masters of camouflage. They're, they're very difficult to detect. And you can look right at them and not see them. Um, but being so cryptic is a, a um, major drawback when it comes to uh, breeding season, nesting season. And it turns out that these are, are probably are the most vocal of our are, are herons. Most herons are not vocal at all. Um, and this is the, the uh, American bittern. And actually, the, the least bittern is a much softer call, but it seems to carry amazingly well. Um. Okay. <laughs> and unlike most of the other herons, bitterns are solitary nesters and they construct a, a platform nest in really marshy, reedy areas. Your nests are generally located amongst cattails, bulrushes, and reeds, and usually just inches above the water. Um, they're unusual in that the American bittern females alone construct the nest, while in least bittern, it's the male only that constructs the nest. And like the uh, green heron, young bitterns leave the nest quickly, um, usually three to four days, and um, for the least and 14 days for the American. Okay. Um, herons are very fascinating to watch and there have been over 30 distinct feeding modes described for, for these birds. Um, you know, most of the fewest have been described for, for bitterns, which given their habitat and secret of dust, that's probably not too surprising. Um, the, the genus Egretta, the snowy tricolored, the little blue and reddish egrets have the highest number of different feeding modes. And fundamental to all these modes is what's called a bill stab. And that's this downward or lateral strike of the head where the, the body remains motionless. And this is where those modified six and seven cervical vertebrae come in. Uh, enables you know, these quick strikes. And you kind of get a sense for it in these two pictures. They're taking a hundredth of a second apart. And you can see that you know, here's the strike, and he's already back, returned to position with his, his prey, a small fish. And the water hasn't even uh, you know, splashed back yet. Now, there are two main modes of capture, uh, impaling um, for large items. Um, they're generally impaled. This was California is a, a thornback ray and they live on the bottom, large fish. And they stabbed right through. Um, Heron brought them up onto the shore 
worked him off the bill and managed to roll him up kind of like a cigar and swallow it. Um, it's an amazing feat. Took about 20 minutes or so, but I did it. Okay. Smaller prey items are usually just grasped. Uh, there's a green heron, the tadpole, and a adult frog. And if you look closely, a number of them, ha herons, have a modification on the tips of the bill. They little serrations that help them grab on or grasp the prey. They, they don't slip off as well. Um, now, the hunting strategies themselves, the most common technique is called just standing. Uh, this is the simplest and by far the most common. And um, it's one of two that are, are shared among all herons. Um, the others being the the other being a slow walk. I'll talk about in a minute. But it's basically you stand in one spot and you wait for something to come to you and you nail it. Um, the, these birds will stand motionless for maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes or more. And once uh, prey is sighted, they'll, they'll strike out. Um, this one grasp this, this teeny catfish and then they'll flip it up and swallow it head first. Usually the standing techniques used in open water, but not always. Uh, you can do it thick vegetation, sometimes standing on an object, a rock or branch. Um, th this hunting technique is not without its drawbacks. Uh, you can hit a submerged rock or some other hard object. You can break the bill or um, this seems to be a common injury is tearing the uh, tissue here. This appears to be its tongue hanging out um, out the side of his mouth. And I've seen this a num on a number of occasions. Uh, um, as I said, herons generally swallow their whole prey and head first um, for fish, which is a main part of their diet that flattens the spines and uh, they'll go down. Uh, unless you're dealing with catfish, which is a very common prey item. Catfish have a mechanism in their spines where they can lock them into place and they won't fold, fold down. So um, it's probably very easy to get injured on, on those. They, they're very sharp and they actually have a toxin in them. Um, this particular heron, and I don't know how common this behavior is, but it, he was actually picking apart and trying to, to take, look like the spines and the head off of this, this particular catfish. Um, so it would probably go down easier. Okay, so I said the second universal hunting mode is to walking slowly. This is strolling deliberately through the shallows. Um, these Birds will uh, often adopt a, a stiff extended neck posture and it allows them to look more or less straight down. And this seems to help cut the glare or the reflection off the water and minimizes any of uh, the distortion from refraction. And they'll also kind of tilt their head back and forth um, and then strike before striking to get a better judge of the distance that they're dealing with. Now, obvious, you know, the extension of slow walking is to speed it up and to, to running. And this is one of the reddish egrets' favorite techniques. Uh, the species can be identified even with at a distance without binoculars just by watching its behavior. Um, another technique that's common, at least uh, among the egretta and green herons, are is foot stirring. And uh, this is a technique that they, um, they used to flush or track prey. It involves extending the foot forward and vibrating it. This also gives you an idea why these yellow feet on the snow egret might be of use. At least you can see, see where your feet are. And see you. Yeah. 
doesn't seem to be a successful, but um, the uh, Heron's Ardia and Egretta and the least bittern uh, employ what's called a wing flick. And I'll just, uh, you know, flash out the wing and hopefully to startle a prey item. Um, uh, variations of that are, are open wing feeding where one wing's extended out um, for several seconds before retracting it. Then there's under wing feeding, which holds the wings out and holds the head under the wings and maybe to cut reflection down. And then kind of the ultimate of this is uh, the idea of uh, canopy feeding, uh, which covers the whole, both wings covering the head. Um, and this will give you, this is a, a reddish egret feeding and stringing a, a number of these behaviors together. So he's doing a walk, breaks into a run, does a build jab. Now he's doing a foot stir. And there he goes into a canopy, grabs a fish, tosses it. Okay, so here's a little better slow motion. And there's the, the jab, grabs the fish, tosses it, and drops it. So he's probably expended a couple hundred calories for, for nothing. Um, number of egrets, particularly cattle egrets, are adept at, at following grazing livestock or farm equipment. Um, and they'll maybe hop after a, a moving object, you know, a cow or a tractor or whatever. And they even actually leapfrog over one another to get a better feeding position. Um, cattle egrets are great gleaners. They'll pick up prey um, that are off the ground. So sitting on a leaf or on a blade of grass. Uh, another common technique among snowies, tricolors, tri and little blues uh, is something called foot dragging. And uh, you know, it's usually used in a situation where the water is too deep to stand in. And then here's one of the behavior that I ran into um, that looked like it started off as foot dragging. Um, yeah, did I stop it? Yeah. There it goes. Yeah, this is a series of still shots. And so he's coming right at me, drops his legs and he spots his fish on the surface. Fish spots him jumps and the, the snowy grabs it in midair. So I, I don't know if that constitutes aerial fly catching as a technique, um, but he brings it back, back to the shore. And I don't know how well you can see that, but there, there's, it looks like this is another injured bird that appears to be his tongue sticking out in the side of his underside of his bill. Now, this is another odd behavior called um, bill vibrating or tongue flicking. And I've only seen this a couple times. And it's where the, the um, heron um, places its bill in the water and vibrates it rapidly to cause ripples and supposedly attracts the fish. Um, and along that same vein, um, a few herons, well, most notably green heron, have learned to place bait in the water to, to lure um, fish into striking range. And sometimes they'll use real food like uh, bread or popcorn or dead insect, something like that. Or uh, they'll even um, create an artificial lure using a uh, floating flower or a stick or a small leaf. So this really puts them in the category of an actual tool maker, which is pretty rare among animals. 
And then there's diving and jumping. Um, some herons really go in, you know, all the way for their prey. Um, sometimes they'll do a head first dive. Um, this one, I'm not sure. I think he probably went in feet first, but it was hard to say. This is a situation um, when I was in Florida, I was out on a little peninsula and filming this great blue. And I like, was done with him. I turned around, I had my back to him and I was filming something else. And I heard this loud, loud splash. And then it dawned on me that oh God, I was awfully close to the edge of the water and there are alligators here. So I probably shouldn't be standing that close. And then I said, well, maybe the alligator grabbed the heron. Um, you know, so when I turned around and looked, yeah, th this is really all I could see. Uh, and I watched him for a minute or two trying to figure out what was going on. And finally, he comes crawling out of the of the, uh, the weeds carrying this fish that had obviously speared. There's a spear hole through him. Um, this is about a three or four pound bass, so that large mouth bass. So this bass weighs probably as much as he does. Um, and he actually grabbed it and um, grabbed it and flew off with it. Um, should point out that, um, you know, a number of the large waders are communal feeders, uh, particularly the snowy egrets. Um, they're like four, four species, uh, if you count the, the uh, glossy ibis here, but uh, there's a great egret and there's some little blues and mostly snowies. Um, but as I said previously, that studies have shown that Feeding in these groups, in such groups, is um, more advantageous than, than hunting alone, that they, they get uh, better nutrition. And, you know, the, the, you could consider mixed feeding flocks to be a form of um, cooperative hunting, although this is kind of just everybody doing their own thing. They're just standing together. But uh, I, I had an incident in out in California that made me wonder if there's actually a little more cooperation involved, some, some sort of thought behind it. That I was in a, a small pond that had about a half a dozen um, black ground night herons. And there's a, several clutches of um, mallard hens with young ducklings. Uh, you know, sitting on the shoreline and almost uh, on cue as, a, as if these black crowns started converging on this mallard and its chicks and kind of walked towards it and forced her into the water. Uh, and she started swimming out away from shore and they let her get off a little ways and, and again started coming at her and then when she was far enough off shore, they flew at her. Um, at that point, she panicked. The, the, the ducklings were panicking, going all over. The, uh, one of the night herons grabbed one of the ducklings, took it back to, to shore, and um, kind of threw it up in the air and downed it you know, head first. It was kind of like throwing a piece of popcorn up in the air and just in one gulp swallowing it. Um, and then immediately the rest of the herons uh, broke off the attack. So, I, you know, I've never seen any reports of anything like that or if there is any actual thoughtful cooperation there, but you know, it was an interesting encounter to, in any of it. So with that, I think I'll go ahead and end it and say thank you for attending and happy waiter watching.